Welcome to Now or Never on CBC Radio 1. I'm Ifi Chiwetelu. And I'm Trevor Deneen. And right now, when you open a newspaper, when you turn on the news on your television, you realize very quickly we're facing a very public health crisis that's affecting Canadians in every corner of the country. An unprecedented spike in overdoses this week in Metro Vancouver. Drug overdoses are happening constantly. Close to 650 people have died so far this year. A state of emergency has been declared because two people are dying. We still every don't day. know if it was fentanyl that sent a nine month old baby boy to hospital this last country, week. country, with health officials struggling to deal with the opioid overdose crisis in BC. There's no question this is a national public health crisis. It is estimated that five Canadians are dying every day from drug overdoses, and many of these are caused by fentanyl, a drug that is so potent that they say just a few grains of it can kill. So on today's episode, we're going to get behind the headlines. We're going to go behind all of the statistics, and we're going to talk to the real people, the ones that are out there dealing with this deadly epidemic head on every single day, volunteers helping with addicts on the streets of Vancouver. There's at least one overdose every day. Sometimes there's been days where we had three or four and one would drop and then all of a sudden we get them going, we turn around, there's another guy that's dropped. We'll hear from others who are desperately trying to save their kids struggling with addiction. I've told her many, many times over the years, stay in touch with me, keep in touch with me. I need to hear from you on a regular basis so that the body they find, I'm not wondering, is it yours? And... A comedian who's been to hell and back and now shares his story on stage. Absolutely true story, not joking at all. I'm a recovering heroin addict and I've been clean and sober for eight years. But you know what's even better than applause? Heroin. (laughs) This is Now or Never. And just a warning, these are real people telling their real stories that they're going through, so some parts are going to be graphic. But stay with us because you're going to meet some people who may remind you of your friends, your coworkers, maybe even yourself, who are facing the fight of their lives. Earlier this week, I was out in Coquitlam, B.C., where I met a young man who has seen the devastating effects of fentanyl firsthand. I'm Nicholas Jansen, 19 years old. Um... I have lost my brother Brandon Jansen. I also lost my girlfriend Guinevere Stadden. Uh, she was 16. And this was all in this past year? Yes, all in 2016. 2016 has been a rough year. I also got through a fentanyl addiction myself. I got through it. I went through multiple rehab centers, treatment centers, and I know it works. I know it doesn't. Nick described himself as being from an upper middle class family. He has two older brothers, a mom who's a successful business owner, and he told me he never really wanted for anything growing up. And then when he was 16, all he really wanted was to be popular and cool like his older brother. And that's when he discovered fentanyl. It was one night on my 16th birthday. um, My brother had previously moved out into his own apartment, and he met um, some sketchy characters, and they... uh, they said, here's this new drug. Um, he's like, do you want to try one? I asked what it is. He said, it's like a fake Oxy. It's just like Oxycontin. Uh, little green pills, AD on one side, CDN on the other. Um, very unknown back then. No one knew what it was. Like, this is when the first wave came into Coquillum. I said, yeah. And I said, how do I do it? I'm not going to inject anything. I'm not going to smoke anything off tinfoil. So he said, you can snort it. And to me, it wasn't evil it didn't look evil there was no evil stories of it killing people Mm -hmm. i just thought of it as a very powerful opiate and i knew i loved opiates so i'm like okay i'll do it what was that first time like i immediately within five seconds of it um getting into my system i felt the biggest rush there's no time release on this like immediately you feel like you're floating and you it almost forces a smile on your face The way you just feel like your brain gets warmer and your head gets warmer and your body gets lighter. And all of a sudden you just feel the best you've ever felt times a thousand. Like you feel like you just won the lottery almost. It's unexplainable because it just just fills a void that you didn't even know you had. One of those pills he was describing, they cost $25. Now he did one pill every day for a week until he ran out of money. 
Now, he thought in his brain that he could quit, but unfortunately, he was wrong. I was so stressed out, so depressed. I hated everything. And the only thing that my brain could think of was the pill. Like, every time I thought about actually doing it, I got a little bit of, like, all that, re like, relief, almost. So, uh, I I knew I was hooked, but I didn't care at that point. I, uh, I'm like, I need to go get more of this, and it's affecting everything. I'm putting this pill over everything else in life. I don't care. I would rather have a pill of this than go on a vacation with my best friends. I, like, I would rather have this than... Um, like, before I really loved jewelry, I really loved my material items. Um, as soon as I started doing those pills, I could sell that stuff for one of them. Nick started doing 10 pills a day, and to pay for that, he ended up having to steal, he was beating people up, he was robbing family and friends. Then the problem got worse, when the withdrawal pains became way too extreme for even himself to handle. Nick's mom found out that he was using the drug, and that's when she decided to get him into a treatment center. Now, she thought he'd be safe and things would start getting better, but unfortunately, that's when even more tragedy struck for the family. I checked into the process, did, filled all the paperwork, went and had a smoke, was talking to all the clients, introducing myself, and all of a sudden they're like, Nick, come back to the office. So I go back into the office, and my brother Dylan, my dad, who I never see, and my mom are there. And I'm like, how did they get here so quick? And like, are they just here to like wish me luck or something, right? And then they told me, they're like, Brandon, Brandon died. It was an overdose inside Sunshine Coast Treatment Center. Brandon, yeah, he overdosed. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was utter disbelief. He was like my dad growing up. I looked up to him very much. He was like my everything. I look, he was my role model. I relapsed after Brandon died. Many times I relapsed. And it got to the point where I was so down and out. I was selling crack on the corner of East Hastings Street until I had over $100. And then I'd go buy a bunch of heroin, go into Insight, and I would put so much heroin in my arm because I knew there was someone to save me. I would just put lethal amounts in my arm just because I tried to get the best high. And, like, I would just... It was a cycle of... Selling drugs, stealing, and doing drugs. Over and over again, then sleeping on the concrete. And the only way I could sleep, if I had drugs in my pocket for the morning. It was hell. It was hell on earth. Um, I hated myself. I, was, I got to the point where I broke down in tears. Like, I was just an utter wreck, right? And uh, so I went back to the treatment center. And, um, and I just, I stayed clean. Um, because... I don't want to just be another urn. My mom goes to sleep every night, and she's my brother. My brother's urn, um, his ashes, like beside her bed. Imagine if she had another box right beside it. Yeah, I can't do that. The hardest part about that is he also lost his girlfriend uh, a few short months after losing his brother as well. So dealing with both of those things at the same time. Hmm. I can only imagine the desperation that could create when you want to run to your coping mechanisms, which are the same ones that have killed people you love. Mm -hmm. Like I can only think of the amount of work, the amount of community probably needed to come out of that. Well, the good news is he says he's been clean for four months now, and that's with the help of his mother. The two of them now go about, and they talk to schools, which has been a great thing that he's been doing. And as well, she started this foundation named after her son, the Brandon Jensen Foundation, in order to help other people that are going through the exact same situation that both of her sons have gone through. And that's where I met Michelle, where we sat down and talked about all the things she's doing and why. You must be very busy these days. Is your calendar just stocked? It is. Uh, every second of every day truly is accounted for. I'm getting the foundation up and running. I'm uh, creating awareness uh, through my media contacts. And um, I also do run a couple other businesses as well. But the foundation, 
I had no idea how much work that was in terms of having it registered and determining, you know, a mission statement and the focus and putting the right talent in place and and coming up with initiatives. And it's been all-encompassing. And basically, it's seven days a week. What time did you get up this morning? At 4.30. What time do you go to bed? Uh, well, four thirty. <laughs> no, typically, you know, eleven o'clock. But yeah, it's it's constant. It's constant. Yeah. What keeps you going? Uh, the change and and making a difference in people's lives. I mean, really, there's nothing more important. It's it's uh, saving lives and um, offering hope to those people out there now that are uh, feeling like they have nowhere to turn. Now, why did you want to start the foundation? When I was trying to navigate through getting treatment for my son, Brandon, um, I found that there was no place where I could turn for answers. Uh, There was nowhere where I could call and say, okay, my son is addicted to fentanyl, he's this old, what are my treatment options, both government and private? And after everything that I did, after all of the rocks that I turned over and all of the money I threw at it, in all of the energy that was put into that. If I couldn't keep my son alive, the average family out there doesn't have a hope. And that's when I knew something had to change. So the foundation um, is meant to be ultimately a resource center so that we can provide guidance and education and awareness and basically pull all those pieces together. Do you remember the first time when you found out Brandon had done fentanyl? Yes, uh, he had he had come to me and had said, Mom, I have a problem. Um, I'm addicted to fentanyl. And he had been using, I think, you know, he had said a couple weeks, but he told me that it uh, took over his life. And that's all he did was chase the next fentanyl high and that he knew it was a problem and he needed help. Did you even know what fentanyl was when he first came to you? No, I had no idea. Had no idea. I've never done drugs in my life. Um, You know, I just um, heard about the conventional drugs out there, you know, and I wasn't naive. I knew that teenagers experiment and things like that, but I had no idea what fentanyl was. And I had no idea once I learned that it was fentanyl, how lethal it could be. Did you notice a difference in him? Like, what was what was Brandon like before the, the addictions and, and the drugs and the fentanyl? Um, very high energy, very charismatic. Um, he, he could just walk into a room. He, he didn't have a shy bone in his body. He'd walk into a room, and he, he would own the room, and he'd make everyone feel comfortable, and he had very quick wit. Um, I remember um, going to a house party one evening with my girlfriend, And he came along because he heard that the parents that were having this house party had teenage kids his age. And he comes in, and there's a room full of teenagers. And he sits down and introduces himself. And one of the girls says, so what do you do for a living? And he says, well, I'm a Calvin Klein underwear model. Like, it just naturally flowed, right? And so he just, I mean, he owned a room. And then when you found out Nick was doing the drug as well, how did, as a mother, to, to have to deal with one child and the worry that comes with that, but then all of a sudden another one starts doing it, like, how do you process that? Oh, it was horrific. It was just putting Band-Aids on bullet holes, really uh, trying to do pedal as fast as I could to find the best treatment options and resources, but yet exercise enough tough love not to allow the drug use in the home, which I wouldn't tolerate, and and nor did the boys expect that that would fly. And so I I knew I had to ask them to leave um, so that life would get hard enough at some point that they would truly want to get better. Um, Because the reality is that if you allow your children to continue using drugs within the family home, it becomes very comfortable. So you're, you're really, you're just enabling. And I was very adamant that that I wouldn't allow that to happen, that either they went to treatment, and if they weren't willing to go to treatment, then they couldn't be in the home. So there were many nights where I knew they were sleeping outside and had nothing to eat. And um, But as a parent, you have to put those parameters in place um, and hope to God that they're going to get to the point where they want help. 
what is it like when you get that phone call from a treatment center where you've sent your son to go get help mm-hmm. and then you find out that it's in that treatment center where he died from doing the drug that he was supposed to be there to get off of? Um, you know, I probably was in complete shock for a couple of days. Um, first trying to process that this could even happen. Um, and then after processing it and, um, you know, I don't know if you ever accept it, but uh, to come up with um, really a plan where this um, shouldn't happen and wouldn't happen to anybody else. Why don't you say to people who are out there and they're listening and they're like, oh, you know what, that would, that would never happen to my kid. That happens to other people's kids. I, that, that can't happen to mine. I used to think that too. Uh, we come from an upper middle class uh, family. Um, you know, my my children never suffered from any type of mental illness, poverty, abuse, none of that. You know, they always been in sports and activities and, and really had everything available to them. So to think that it only hits those other people um, it's it. That's not the case. It's not a downtown East Side issue. It can hit uh, your son, daughter, brothers, sisters, you know, mothers, fathers, anybody from all walks of life. And um, here in BC, especially here in the Lower Mainland, it is hitting hard the suburban uh, teenagers. What's the biggest hurdle you have to overcome just to get? to raise awareness about this whole fentanyl addiction, the fentanyl problem that's going on? My biggest challenge is is, is having the government move quickly enough to open interim emergency treatment beds because the reality is such that once you're addicted to fentanyl, no type of outpatient counseling or treatment is going to be sufficient to overcome that. And fentanyl is killing people one to two a day. Those numbers are increasing. So we need comprehensive inpatient treatment facilities. So I'm frustrated with the government, you know, um, setting up forums and committees to talk about the problem when money needs to be put towards opening up the beds. Secondly is the amount of, of awareness out to the people as, you know, the adults, they watch the news. There's this public service ad campaign that the government has funded. So there's posters and bars and restaurants. But what they have missed is targeting the youth, which is why through the Brandon Jansen Foundation, my son Nick and I are speaking at um, as many high schools as we can get to. How many more schools do you have lined up to talk to? We have six schools lined up right now mm-hmm. and a lot more to come. We sent off an email, emails to every school in the province and getting responses back from each and every one. What went through your mind right before you walked on stage? To the first school? Yeah. Um, I hope they listen. I hope they listen. I went in there thinking, if I can at least reach one kid, and I save one kid from going down the road I went down and possibly dying, that's one entire family and friend group that I'm saving. Because the addiction is so selfish. People don't realize that you think you're only hurting yourself. You're like, this is only me. Let me do my thing. But it's killing everyone around you. You're, t- you're pulling them down with you, mm-hmm. right? Like, people come up, come up to us after and we're like, I just got through addiction, or I'm I'm addicted, or my friends are really bad right now, they're doing fentanyl. Everyone thinks, oh, yeah, but I I know my drug dealer, or oh, I can do it, I know I know how to do it, I'm not going to be the one that, that dies. And that's not the case. It's Russian roulette. You don't know if you're going to die the first time, you don't know if it's going to be the 20th time. But the reality is you don't find anyone that's been addicted to fentanyl for a long time. And the reason for that is because they're dead. Do you talk a lot to the families, to, to, to like parents of people who have addictions? Do you hear from them? I do. I do. I'm contacted multiple times a week by families with, with kids that are addicted or uh, families that send me pictures of their kids that have died. And it's all the time. It's all the time. It's the luxury of time to deal with this epidemic, with this health care crisis. We, we don't have that option. That ship has sailed, and things have to happen now um, because 
every day we're losing more and more people and the numbers continue to escalate. And while we're trying to address the fentanyl issue, now different forms of fentanyl are coming over from overseas, such as car fentanyl and other things being produced in labs. So the numbers are just going to escalate. Is it hard going from being a mother who's going through grief to suddenly becoming some sort of beacon of hope for people as well? It's, um, I had a decision to make um, when Brandon died, either wallow in that, and I just, you know, I grieve and just barely function, if you will, or I harness the grief and the frustration, the sorrow, and all the anger, and I do something about it. And I have a voice. I'm very assertive by nature. Um, and I'm not one to sit around and complain about things or to wait for other people to do it. So I took a stand. I'm happy to do so. And um, people have been reaching out constantly to say, you know, thank you and how can I help? And it's that, that awareness being generated throughout the country that is going to facilitate change. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk yeah. to us today. Thank you. You're listening to Now or Never on CBC Radio 1. I am Ifi Chiwetelu. And I'm Trevor Deneen. And if you've been listening to our story so far, you've heard some really touching things about a mother and son who've been very affected by drug addiction. If you're curious about their story or any of the others on our show, visit our website, cbc.ca slash now or never, to see some pictures and to hear more about their stories. Or if you want to share any of your thoughts, visit our Facebook page, CBC Now or Never. So in Vancouver, there's this legal supervised injection site called Insight. It's a place where people can go if they want to use drugs safely and with clean needles as well. Now, if you walk past this place, some days the lineups can be all the way around the block just to get inside. And because of this, there's some people who have decided to take it upon themselves and open up a pop-up injection site, which is just around the corner. So we decided to visit this place. It's in Vancouver's downtown east side. And when you walk up to it, you walk through these gates, and you walk into this area that's like a little flea market. And as you walk past all these people, you get to the back, and that's where there's two tents sitting there. I had no idea what to expect, and as I rounded the corner, that's where I saw a woman sitting on a chair inside the tent with some needles in front of her. Hi there. What's your name? Mm, Lori Vidan. What brought you down here to the, the, the tent today? I came down here looking for a friend of mine, somebody that helped me out, and I uh, just heard he was down here. What's in the tinfoil there? Heroin. Do you do that when you're here? No, I just started doing it again about a week ago. What made you start doing it again, if you don't mind me asking? I don't know. Were you going to do some right now before we came walking up? Yeah, but I don't really need to because I'm already high. High from heroin before or something different? No, it was just heroin. Is this a good place for you to come to in order to do this? Yeah, it's safe. Have you had incidents in the past where you've overdosed or needed somebody? Maybe once or twice. In my hometown I did. I just want to go home. I'm Dan. I'm at the downtown street market. How did you get involved with this? Well, I've been working for the street market for about three years, and then it's been three months ago or so, then we open this. We clean the tables. We keep an eye on people. We Narcan them if we have to. We'll get the ambulance here, take them away, or keep an eye on them after we're done with them. And, and you're just in a back alley here? Yes. There's people sitting down. People using, there's rigs, there's... I don't know, they come in, talk, hang out with their friends, and 
use in a safe spot, basically. Does that speak to how desperate the situation is that you're able to put a pop-up safe injection site into the, like a back alley? We just one day decided to set it up because there was everybody overdosing in this back lane, so we figured it was safe to do this, and it works. Yeah. It, it's helping people, so it's, it's perfect. Have you had any pushback from authorities for being here? At uh, first, we had the cops come here and try closing it down, and we were like, no, we, we need this. Would you rather them die in a back lane or be saved in a tent? So, How many people do you see come through here in a, on a daily in basis? A day, a minimum 100 people come in here every day. So Some of them are repeats that come in and out, but we still have to mark them down and just so we know what they're doing and stuff. And, and if you wouldn't have been here, these are people who are just being right there in the alley? Yeah, they'd be, they'd be sitting here in the back lane and there'd be no one to look after them or they'd be passing away. Or How long do you keep an eye on? Because you, as you look inside the tent here, you see a gentleman who's obviously slumped over. How long? If they're nodding out or something, we'll go up to them and bump them, see if they're okay. And if they turn blue or if they're overdosing, we'll, we'll help them out. We'll Narcan them, call 911 and do what we have to do to save them. And yeah, I've saved about 30 people since we opened myself. Really? Yeah. There's at least one overdose every day. Sometimes there's been days where we had three or four and one would drop and then all of a sudden we get them going, we turn around, there's another guy that's dropped, so it's, it's pretty bad. Well, for a week is the worst. Do you think there should be more of these in the city? Yeah, oh yeah, almost every back lane ought to have one of these. Every back lane you'll find somebody using. Can I ask you your name? Jennifer. Jennifer? Yeah. And how long have you been coming here to help out? A couple days. I just started coming down. What made you decide? I work at another facility in the city that has a harm reduction room, and I so I'm, I'm familiar with drug addiction. And when you are here, what do you do when you're here? Do you just kind of stand over and watch? Just watching that everyone's breathing. Yeah. Yeah. And signing people in. We sign people in, and we keep track of what they're doing. I haven't had to resuscitate anybody so far, but I know what to do if I need to. I mean, no one chooses to be like this, right? It's not sort of somebody just wanting to get high and throw caution to the wind and not be responsible for their lives. A lot of people have a lot of trauma in their lives and they're trying to soothe their soul, as we all do, right? We have a bad day at work and we want to soothe our soul one way or another, and I think that's what's going on for a lot of folks. So harm reduction is one thing, providing them a safe place to inject their drugs, but let's help them to not get here in the first place, right? So it's none of my business to say, oh, you should stop doing drugs. But I can say, here's some clean equipment, because I'd love for you not to get hep C, HIV, whatever, skin abscess, yeah. right? And, and I would love for them to have clean drugs. I would love for everybody on heroin to have synthetic heroin and go to a heroin place and be given it. Yeah. This stuff is cut with crap. They don't want it cut with other stuff, right? So it's unfortunate. I don't know why there's so much fentanyl in the system right now. 100 times stronger than morphine. Morphine's strong enough, right? When you fentanyl, you'll go down in minutes. What do you say to people who think uh, that you shouldn't have these places, that these places shouldn't exist? They don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. You're listening to Now or Never on CBC Radio 1. I'm Trevor Deneen. And I'm Ifi Chiwetelu. And this week, we've been hearing some really touching and vulnerable stories about being on the front lines of drug addiction. This next person I want to introduce you to, he has a unique and personal take on addiction and recovery. I remember meeting Mark Hughes at a comedy show, and he stands in my mind as someone to remember because his material was some of the most shockingly offensive stuff that I've ever heard. Really? It, yeah, it was a dark comedy show, so I was expecting some racier bits, but what he said was sex, violence, and drugs in a way that I feel like you've probably never heard. Now you've got me wanting to find this. If you're curious, go to YouTube, look up Mark Hughes comedy, um, but don't say I didn't warn you. It's heavy stuff. Mark is now opening up about the reality behind some of those jokes, and he's putting it all out there in a one-man show called Tragedy Plus Time Served Equals Comedy. Now, I got to hear the show, and at the start of it, he remembers his first time drinking. In, in, in the matter of seconds, I was looking through eyes that for once didn't have anxiety and paranoia. I don't know if other people are born like that, like centered or confident, but now I had a solution, a cure, and a purpose. First, I had to puke my guts out. 
<laughs> in the show, Mark takes you through his younger years in Vancouver, which were unfortunately plagued with a lot of sexual abuse and drug use that eventually led to an addiction to heroin and cocaine. He was stealing and robbing people to support his habit. He said some of these acts got increasingly violent. He was in and out of jail and sometimes homeless. I've been up at one point for three weeks and I was doing crime like a starving animal because I was completely homeless. I had nowhere to go. And I was just shooting cocaine as much as I could so I didn't have to worry about where I was going to sleep. You stay awake enough, you don't need to bed, right? So I think I have a solution to homelessness here. <laughs> you just give them enough cocaine. <laughs> they don't need housing, okay? He's lived it, so he jokes about it. And it, it wasn't until he committed to a 12-step program while he was in jail that he finally got sober and not long after that, discovered comedy. So I asked him how he made that leap. I'd been out of prison about six years, and my life had gotten fairly average and normal. So I had a job and friends. and Because so many of the years of adjusting to being in society were like a struggle, once there wasn't a struggle, I didn't know what to do anymore. So a friend of mine said to me, you need a creative outlet. Um, because of my mind is just so active and it's so hyper and I just need to do something with it. And I think he meant like oil painting or pottery or something like that, but... Or yoga. Or yoga or something, right? But people had always told me I was funny uh, from both public speaking stuff I'd done and on Facebook. But I'd never... Th I thought my brand of comedy wasn't um, marketable. I thought it was too offensive because I was offending people even before I'd ever stepped on stage to tell a joke. And then I just took a comedy class. And I won't say I killed, but I was competent enough at it to go, okay, I think I could work at this. If I'd bombed and sucked right away, I would, I would have been like, nope, I'm not doing that. But it was just good enough where I was like, I could, I could put some time and effort into this. And like, not all my jokes are like triple X rated or anything like that. And not all of them are taught about heroin or robbing banks or, or, or serious subject matter. But some of my best jokes are about subjects that by all rights, you're not supposed to joke about, right? Child molestation. I have one about snuff films. I have like all, all this stuff, right? And it's, it, it, but I made them funny. I remember my first Mark Hughes stand up experience. And I, I was saying this to you earlier. Yeah. I remember watching it and I think my jaw just slowly opened. So I ended up in prison uh, and they gave me nine years. Uh, true story. You can Google that. Mark Hughes. Uh, Every time the website gets a hit, I make a bit of money off of it. <laughs> You're helping a recovering addict get on his feet, all right? Um, I did seven of the nine years, and my dad is still mad at me. He's like, you can never finish anything you start, eh, Mark? <laughs> is comedy one of those things that helps you think, take your mind off the pain? Comedy's a funny one. A lot of people think it's therapeutic. I would say I, I, it might even be a form of acting out. Um, I don't know if comedy's good for me all the time or not. Just recently, uh, it started really being heavy on my head. How so? Um, I it comedy can feel like a fight a lot of the time. Like and I don't just mean the on stage part. Like the whole from the time you get up and you try and get on shows to the writing to the interacting with other comedians to the audience reactions to the the having to think about what went wrong with your joke to having to think about what went right with your joke to having to do, it's a lot of work uh, and. I'm still not at a level where I'm quite good enough to get paid all the time. So I'm doing all this as a hobby and for free. In fact, comedy's cost me a lot of money too. And it just started wearing me down. And because of the nature of the type of comedy I do, I do a kind of quote unquote offensive style of comedy that can be hard too. And sometimes people, um, eat my, even my colleagues don't really like it that much either. And it, it so it can just feel like this is a, it can start feeling like a burden and the laughs are great. But getting laughs for five minutes a night with all that other work sometimes just doesn't seem worth it. But that's why I started, uh, I, I, I wrote this show is because I, people were always telling me, you should do a one-man show, you should do a one-man show. It's like, okay, fine, I'll do a one-man show. So that's how this show ended up going. So I'm not, it's an outlet for me to talk about my life without having to be like, okay, I got to have a laugh every 30 seconds, right? And I can go to dark places and, it's, and it can be uncomfortable and it can stay uncomfortable and it does get there. 
because the atmosphere I create with the show is dark. It is because that was my life. There's a happy ending, but it it's it's sort of like here's what how I see life and here's why, mm -hmm. right? Um, I thought I'd, I had the world by the balls. I thought I haven't, but I, I've quit using drugs. I haven't used them for a few years now. I just don't do crime, don't do drugs, and pretend it, pretend it all never happened. And it wasn't that simple, because I, you can't just pretend it didn't happen. I've been I've been doing this for my whole a huge portion of my life, and so I I try and interact with people, and it would all come up, and I would just think, okay, well, I'll lie about it. I'll just make up a bunch of stories about where I was. Like, where'd you graduate from high school? Ah, somewhere in the Fraser Valley. You wouldn't have heard of it, right? How come you don't know what a T4 slip is? Ah, it's against our religion. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Things like that. But what it, what it ended up doing, though, uh, conducting myself like that and maintaining that attitude has made me feel more separate from other people. So you've said a lot of people kind of expect for you to look at comedy as kind of therapeutic, yeah. and you, you say no. Yeah. Does this show feel therapeutic? This show is helpful, yeah, um, because it, it, it's well-received. It, it's respected, too. Uh, people are, are, are appreciative of it. I get feedback, like, that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen, and, and I get people saying, like, you're an inspiration and stuff. I, and I don't, uh, I'm uncomfortable with the inspiration part, but what I am hopeful for is that if, if I am, in, tr in fact, an inspiration... Maybe someone will get help or change their life because of something I heard I said, mm -hmm. right? And if nothing else, I'm at least giving, again, the normal people a perspective that they might not have otherwise heard. Uh, one of the reviews that was written about my about it was the reporter kept having to remind himself that this is true. And I, I, not that I have a message with this. I don't have an agenda with the show, but I do. It's nice to hear that because, like, yeah, people, hard stuff happens. And my wish would be for people that make space for those of us who have to come back from the hard stuff. Because sometimes it's like we come back from the hard stuff, we work our asses off, and it's like, yeah, but you didn't say it right. Just be yourself, but can you modify it so it's more comfortable for us, right? I wish they'd suspend all their kind of stuff at the door and just be like, okay, I'm going to remain open-minded here. How long have you been sober now? Ten years. I think it's interesting because you are a stand-up comedian and i know that the spaces that stand-up comedy thrives in involve a lot of these things that you're saying you're trying to avoid mm -hmm. how how are you navigating that so basically i have, a, I have an abstinence policy around drugs and alcohol so i will not do any mind-altering drugs i will not do any criminal activity i just i can't that's just uh, out here we have a thing called the sky train where it's kind of an honor system thing Lots of people don't pay. They just take their chances. I have to pay because it's, it's like a, an accumulative thing. I do it once, then I do it again. The next thing you know, six months later, I'm robbing a bank, right? So I just have to maintain vigilance around, like, my conduct, around honesty and integrity. It's basically I have to try and conduct myself the exact opposite of how I used to. So what would the old Mark do? Okay, don't do that. I've got to try and conflict resolve. I've got to admit when I'm wrong. I've got to make amends to people when I've hurt, harmed them. It's almost, um, I'm not Buddhist, but I almost have to carry around a Buddhist-like philosophy around things. It's like, no, do no harm. Uh, to make sure I'm presenting as best I can without being too hard on myself, too, because sometimes it's just, okay, maybe I'm abrasive and on Wednesday, November 23rd, 2016, I did my best, and I can't always take out the mallet and the hammer to chisel away at myself, right? So, Do you still go to 12-step programs? Yes, I do. Why? Uh, because it's my maintenance. It, it's what got me clean and sober, so why monkey with the formula or the recipe? And I, I go also because I have to be available to help people. So someone just getting out of a detox center, I can share my experience and story with them. Here's what my first day clean was like. Here's what my second day clean was like. Here's what I did after 30 days. Here's how I got a job. Here's how I found housing. Here's how, and I mean, the formula for me might not work for other people, but at least it's, it's a guide. It's it, uh, some kind of a guide. Cause when I first got to recovery, I didn't have any guide. I, I didn't even know. So if someone even gave me a map that wasn't exactly took the long way or not the right way, at least it was a map, because it's better to have a map that's wrong than no map at all, in my opinion. 
So what advice do you give for someone who's just starting on their journey to recovery? I would just say if you're trying to get clean or you want to get clean, it's important to find a community. And it doesn't have to be 12-step necessarily. They're just people where you can uh, be, feel safe around, where people who can help you. Uh, addiction can't really be conquered alone. If it's not 12-step, you need a counselor or you need a peer group or you need to go to church or it's something. It, to sit at home and just go, I'm not going to use anymore, very rarely works. Um, it's all, I Also, I would warn people, just because I would have appreciated this, it's going to be a lot of work. It's not, it, recovery is not for quitters. It, it, it's very tough, but it can be done. One of the things I appreciate most about my community and the people I met is I'm allowed to just go, hey, I think about killing myself and it doesn't freak people out. They go, oh yeah, I, I think about that sometimes too, just because life gets overwhelming. And then we can go, hey, I want to go grab a coffee? Yeah, okay. That's it. And then I was heard. I didn't have to be alone with those feelings for that, for that moment. Has the reward of recovery been worth the work? Yep, and as as macabre or morbid as this sounds, but that's just me. If I were to die tomorrow, I'd die happy. I felt I feel like I've accomplished enough in life. I really appreciate what he says about community because I think the lack of having someone who understands you or you can come to with some of your worst stuff is also the same thing that can have people that can lead them down the path to addiction. I think it's uh, what doesn't get talked about enough is the courage of an addict. Not only to battle the addiction, but to be honest about it. And he's not stopping there. If anyone is curious about Mark Hughes, he's actually putting together a safe injection comedy fundraiser December 8th in Vancouver. This is Now or Never on CBC Radio. I'm Ifi Chiwetelu. And I'm Trevor Deneen. Today we've been hearing from some of the real people affected by drug addiction. So far in the show, we've heard from volunteers who are working with addicts, and we heard from a young man who lost his brother to addiction. And now we have a mom who's desperately trying to help out her daughter. I'm Roxanne Shuttleworth, and I'm a mom and a grandmother, and my daughter struggled with addiction most of her life. She lives a risky lifestyle. I've told her many, many times over the years, stay in touch with me, keep in touch with me. I need to hear from you on a regular basis so that the body they find, I'm not wondering, is it yours? Roxanne Shuttleworth is a single mom. She's also an Indigenous designer in Winnipeg. Now, this past fall on a cold Monday night, her daughter got together to do a drug with someone she knew. She didn't know, and neither did her friend know what they were what they were taking and he was told it was a new drug and they both tried it on the tip of their pinkies. They were sitting on the couch. He was leaning on her and she kind of jokingly pushed him and said, what are you doing? Uh, Sit up type of thing and he fell back against her and she looked at him and realized he was turning blue. She dialed 911 and stayed on the phone with them until the um, paramedics arrived. But at that point, she could feel herself losing consciousness. And uh, so they were both admitted that that Monday night. I got a call from her uh, Tuesday evening, and uh, she told me she was in the hospital, and she sounded um, different, uh, very weak and uh, almost breathless. And that was the first time she was aware enough and coherent enough to um, know that she needed to get in touch with me. I stayed with her that evening, went back the next day, and and no, she wasn't conscious, so I just sat with her until she became conscious. And my understanding was they couldn't p- confirm. Um, apparently the labs, the lab, there's one lab in Manitoba's backed up. They were treating her for a carfentanil overdose, and she was uh, getting the anti- the antidote every two hours for the first two days. She told me she died. She remembers someone calling her uh, to come back. 
that shook her up quite a bit. She was very concerned about her friend, but I couldn't get any information for her because I'm not immediate family. And uh, what I know now is he did, he died, he didn't make it. So she's now recovering, uh, grieving tremendously, uh, going through survivor guilt. Roxanne's daughter is 31 years old. Hers was one of many overdoses that happened in Winnipeg earlier this fall. But we found out about Roxanne because she did something unique. She went online to share her daughter's story. I asked her why. She had posted first. I I didn't post until I saw her post, which I think was a day or two later. And the main reason was awareness to start that discussion. So what was your daughter's post that started things off? Just that kind of cheekily I died, I'm here. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, she's gone public. So then I posted. And plus I was looking for prayer support and um, letting people know addiction is rampant. I don't know any families not affected by addiction. There's a lot of shame and blame. And I keep saying in my posts since then, no shame, no blame. Because in my experience, addiction is a symptom and it's a symptom of trauma and most often childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. So I've been telling people, I don't care. Let's not blame. Let's not shame people. Let's help them. Mm -hmm. How do we help them? And since you've posted your post, have people been really nice about not shaming, not blaming, but just being supportive? Or have you had moments where people have? I've had moments where people are giving you backlash. What have they said? They don't. You don't post. Why are you posting this? Oh yeah. Like keep it private. Don't keep it. Yeah, keep it. Don't talk about it. Keep it private. Um, and I've always been very, very careful. I never ever mention my daughter's name or her friend's name. Why is that? Because that's their story, and it's not mine. So I'm just sharing from my perspective as mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is something you've been dealing with for for a while, correct? Because mm-hmm. your daughter has had. Uh, Addiction issues, issues for a long time, yeah. How long have they been going on for? I found out when my daughter was 9 or 10. I don't think she meant to tell me or or she didn't know how to tell me. And uh, she, and she's always been very, very honest with me. So she told me she'd tried pot. And she told me she'd tried a beer. And I think she was 11. So she was admitting to me at that age that she was trying these things. And I was honest with my kids and I said, you come from a long line of alcoholics, you know, and drug addicts. So chances are that's where you're going if if you continue down this path. I was always scared, always scared. Do you remember the point where you went from being worried to being scared? The gangs wanted her badly, very, very badly. They went after her hard because she's a leader. She's smart. She's strong. And so I know when she was um, 12 or 13, I, uh, with help of friends and family, got her out of the city secretly undercover and was an anti-gang or former gang members who were helping me get her out because they said they want her. She's strong, she's smart, she's all these things. And so I got her out of the province and she was hidden away. We were always searching, what next? What do we try next? What do we, what's the next thing we do? You know, it was just um, letting her know we're there for her. So she's 31, so it's about 20 years. How has your role changed over those years, trying to help her? It's always changing and it's always evolving, I call it. And I've got a good support network. I have a lot of uh, friends and family, actually, who are recovered addicts. And so I go to them, you know, this is what I'm dealing with, this is what's going on. And then there's support there. And then, of course, ceremony, traditional person and practicing. So that's where I get my supports. Uh, But the most profound word said to me was by an uncle who 
is a recovered addict. But he said to me, you will either love her to death, which is enabling, or you will love her for life, your choice. And that was very profound for me. And then, then I kind of got it and I was able to carry on again and continue to say no. Because mm-hmm. the addicts are very, very good at ripping you apart and ripping your heart out and, and making you feel like the absolute worst human being on the face of the earth. But So it takes a lot to say no and not enable. I think a lot of people who've never dealt with addiction don't understand that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. How much of a toll it takes on yeah. the loved ones. Yeah. Because you're sitting there front line the whole time. You care so much about this person. Mm-hmm. And then you have to deal with, like you said, being ripped apart yourself mm-hmm. and knowing it's not coming from a, from a real place. No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. How is your daughter doing right now? She's struggling. She's still struggling, um, grieving. When you mentioned being someone who has to sit back and, and deal with the hurtful words that are said to you when they're in the throes of things. Is there the balance though? Do you have those moments where she recognizes what you are doing and is grateful for the help you're providing? Yeah. 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 What do those moments feel like when you're in those? They're of course feel wonderful. I don't, I take them for what they are when they are. And I'm grateful. When was the last one that you remember that stands out in your head? About a year ago. What happened? We were in ceremony, and she she made it known how how she she knew how hard it was on the family, you know what she's going through. Those moments must make you push harder when those tough moments come through. Yeah, yeah. It's not so much pushing harder; it's hanging on. Because I don't know that we push or mm-hmm. survivors of addicts or, you know, family of addicts push. It's more you hang on. And sometimes you feel like you're hanging on by your fingernails or your fingertips. But you, it's more of a hanging on than pushing. Because we can't push. That's something they have to do. We can just be there when they make that decision and make that choice. But I'm always praying that faith is what keeps me balanced and not getting sucked into, uh, um, I call it a downward spiral of worry, fear, and trauma. And, you know, having that faith that someone is watching out for us Mm -hmm. and for her. Roxanne, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today. You're welcome.